Okay, good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome our guest speaker today, Dr. Young K. Kim. A brief background on Dr. Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim is a clinical assistant professor at NYU College of Dentistry, Department of Prosthodontics, my former home. He is a board certified prosthodontist and practices surgical and reconstructive prosthodontics in private practice in Manhattan when he is not teaching at the dental school. Dr. Kim earned his DMD degree from Boston University School of Dental Medicine. He then completed a four-year advanced training program in prosthodontics from Harvard School of Dental Medicine for Doctor of Medical Sciences. During his time at Harvard, he was awarded the prestigious honor as a President's Scholar. Dr. Kim's doctorate thesis at Harvard was, and pardon my pronunciation, injectable bioactive gelatin hydrolonic calcium phosphate and its oxygenic potential for flapless guided bone regeneration which was awarded the first place winner during the Regional American College of Prosthodontists. Dr. Kim is currently a reviewer for the Journal of Prosthodontists, one of the most premier publications in prost specialty, and he also serves as a reviewer for the Dental Review Journal. Dr. Kim was the editor and co-leader for the NYU Implant Project in 2020 and 2021, and this led to a publication of restorative manual that is now shared with over 12 countries, 13 states, and 28 institutions. Dr. Kim also heads the Yomi Robotic Surgery Project at NYU and was instrumental in establishing the first pre-doctoral robotic implant surgical curriculum in the United States. He is a rising star and was the first ever recipient of the new Rising Faculty Award at the NYU Academy of Distinguished Educators. Please give a warm welcome to the very talented Dr. Young Kim. Well, thank you very much for uh, such a great intro, Dr. Chu. It's very uh, exciting to invite uh, as a guest lecturer today, um, and I invited some of my colleagues and you know, NRU students as well for this, uh, you know, especially on this holiday for the leisure education. So um, welcome everyone, and I uh, hopefully you enjoy the lecture. And uh, I try to make my lecture with more images uh, to make it more uh, entertaining. So you know, of course, I put some educational content in it. And as Dr. Chu mentioned, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me a question uh, at the end. So uh, let me begin the lecture. So as you can see um, previously and right now, the, the title of my lecture is the Surgical Prosthetics uh, in the Era of Computer-Guided Implant Placement. And uh, you, most of you may ask, uh, what is prosthetics? Um, <laughs> uh, when I was a pre-doctoral student, I, I thought pros is only for dentures. So I, I called them denture specialists. Uh, but um, once you learn uh, and go deeper in, in the field of prosthetics, it's a more broad uh, scope of uh, subspecialties involving the uh, removable prosthetics uh, and the fixed prosthetics, uh, as well as uh, implant prosthetics. And, and now uh, we, we have the, um, the surgical pros. Um, and ever since Dr. Brandmark, who was the orthopedic surgeon, uh, you know, connected this to uh, with the OS integration and the oral facial environment. Um, at that time, only the oral surgeons and profs were the only specialists involving the implant rehabilitation. But now we have all scope of practitioners, including general dentists, uh, placing implants. And of course, in the field of prosthetics, we are placing implants as well, uh, especially along with the guided implant surgery, the computer guided surgery systems. And uh, to go through a little detail about uh, you know, some of the newly established uh, the curriculum. Uh, and, and as of now, all of the PROS residency programs in the United States require uh, the PROS residents to experience a surgical implant placement. And, and, and this includes a wider scope of understanding from the OS integration to the periosteal wound healing. And, and uh, you know, depending on your, 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 your uh, PROS resident programs, uh, you get to experience uh, you know, different number of implant fixtures or the scope of the treatment uh, modalities like a full mouth implant rehab or simple cases. But um, the bottom line is you, you get to experience this surgical placement in your residency. And uh, just like any subject matter, if you are to perform any clinical procedures to the patient, uh, understanding the principles and the foundation is, is critical. And, and for me, uh, as Dr. Chu mentioned, uh, at Harvard, I researched uh, the, in the tissue engineering lab uh, uh, and uh, at Harvard Medical School and MIT for developing an injectable bone graft material. And then this experience allowed me to deeply fine tune the osteogenic knowledge in, in the realm of implant dentistry. 
And uh, as of 2016, uh, the American Board of Prosthetics established the surgical implant placement section and, and the board certification examination as well. So this sort of fluctuated a, a paradigm shift in, in the society of newly graduating pros, um, the prosthodontists, including myself and my colleagues and some of my, some of my, some of my mentors as well. So <clears throat> if you have a social media account, I'm sure you, know, you saw one of the profiles on the slide uh, who are great mentors and colleagues in the field of surgical prosthetics. And, and one of the beauties in surgical process is, is that you can develop your profession through a, a variety of way of specialization. And, and besides board certification, as I mentioned, uh, with the implant surgery section, uh, after residency, you can further pursue like perio or implant fellowship uh, or even maxillofacial process, or, or just like me with intense basic science research and, and bone biology. And it's very fascinating to see the dynamic change of, of new generation in the field of prosthetics, um, especially in the computer guide systems. And as a side note, uh, you know, we, we do have social media these days, and, and I think it, it's, a, it's a fantastic platform where we can educate and not only presenting the patient cases, but also motivate each other uh, through our colleagues, you know, seeing our colleagues uh, in the cases and, and all of which um, lead into the improvement of the patient care. So as a prosthodontist or reconstructive dentist, you know, we encounter with uh, various types of patient cases. And, and the, the key thing is to, to connect your, your diagnostic phase uh, with uh, visualizing your final prosthetic rehabilitation. Uh, it's not just uh, implant rehabilitation, but also any reconstructed dentistry. You should be able to visualize your final destination, the final aesthetics and functional uh, aspects of your treatment outcome uh, at the very beginning, the ground zero. And uh, that's where I believe the prosthetically driven implant surgery came out. And, and um, you know, I'm sure you want to you know you you may already have heard about the prosthetic driven implant surgery, but uh, I believe it's nothing but more, uh, you know, creating a blueprint for your final destination. So what I mean is when you're to place an implant, you need to, you need to, you know, think about your final, uh, the, the shape of the teeth and, and which includes the aesthetics uh, and, and, you know, the patient's smile dynamics with the different verticals, how that changes the, the lip postures. And all of these incorporations should be, should be, uh, you know, thought out at the very beginning uh, for your, the whole trajectory of treatment planning. And this becomes even more important when you're incorporating the, or the occlusion. You know, the, we, we, you know, when you guys see the denture cases, you incorporate the extra references like our trigger spine you know, into pupillary lines, but all of these become even more critical, if, uh, especially if you're dealing with uh, more advanced uh, and full arch cases. <clears throat> and also the function, you know, the, besides the aesthetic and occlusion, you're, 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 you, you need to think about the, the occlusal schemes, you know, how you're going to achieve the final, uh, you know, the occlusal scheme of your patient reconstruction, are you going to generate the canine guidance, or are you going to achieve group functions or bilateral balance occlusions if you're treating a denture cases. But all those occlusal dynamics should be also incorporated for your planning and also the executing the real surgical rents. And, and if you can foresee the, the prosthetically driven rehabilitation, um, the functional occlusal scheme can be well achieved, and, uh, not only the static occlusion, but also through the dynamic, uh, the occlusion, the way the patient function, you know, the power functional habit, all those things will be nicely harmonized together for the for achieving the patient, for maximizing the, pa the patient a treatment outcome. And now we have guided implant surgery, where we can pre-plan the implant fixture positions in the software, and and this allows you to to incorporate your your planning ahead of time. You know, even the surgical intervention, and and you know, some cases you you need to pursue the bone augmentation simultaneously, or a science elevations, uh, all of which you should pre-plan. You are able to pre-plan 
before the surgical arena. And, and I think that's a key difference. Whereas comparing the freehand surgery before, um, you can analyze your case uh, very thoroughly um, uh, during your, your, your uh, planning phase. And um, once you place the implant prosthetically, of course, the outcome of your processes will be following uh, you know, in, in a very predictable way. And you know, if, even if it's a single unit implant or a full arch implant, uh, you can incorporate those informations uh, for the benefit of your patient care. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, whenever we treat the patient, uh, you know, especially more moderate to complex cases, uh, you know, we need to think about the, the, the final, the aesthetics and occlusal rehabilitation at the very beginning. And that's the constant, you know, the value that it, it's not changing. Uh, whereas we have different methodologies. Uh, when you're to place an implant, you can choose to place a free hand surgery uh, or static guided surgeries. Or now we have more advanced technologies like Yomi robotic assisting surgeries that we're establishing at NYU right now. And, and there are other techniques like dynamic guided surgeries. Uh, different methodologies exist, but uh, the foundation of the final goal of uh, rehabilitating the, the processes stays the same. So I, I think uh, that's the key message that I want to narrate in this lecture and uh, you know, going through some of my cases and some of the content educations so that you can, you can see where we can connect all that into this uh, prosthetically driven implant surgery. So let's say if you're placing single unit implant, uh, this is a relatively simple case in the aesthetic zone, uh, you need to also think about, besides thinking about the anatomical criteria, you know, like uh, mesodistal, buccal in the bone depth, uh, the, 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 the keratinized tissue thickness, and uh, inter-implant distances or interdental distances, inter-art spaces, you incorporate all that to place an implant even if you're going for the freehand surgeries. But one thing I wanna you know, emphasize in this moment, if you see the last photo, uh, it's, a, it's a custom healing abutment. And what it is, is uh, we, we come up with the emergence profile, uh, which is a space uh, that's generated by the critical contour of your future crown. And, and if you imagine uh, your future shape of your crown, and if you connect the trajectory line to the plat implant platform, there's a connection transition between those two. So if your gum tissue, the level of the gum tissue is below that area, then uh, when you're to rehabilitate your crown in reference to the adjacent teeth, then unless you're pushing it too paleolingually, you know, there is already set reference of the buccal contour. And if so, then by having this gum tissue below that line, you will have severe undercut, which is obviously non-hygienic. And uh, that's where the emergence profile concept comes in. It may sound a little complicated, but if you think about the basic principle of implant placement, you can understand this uh, quite clearly. But you know, therefore, if you create this emergence profile an ideal level, uh, you know that the critical contour is within the range of the emergence profile, then your final crown shape will be more natural looking, more hygienic, will be nicely. Uh, you know, to, to harmonize with the tissue around it. So, and then you can be creative, you know, the, along with the foundation knowledge, you can be creative in a way that, uh, you know, you can measure the tissue mobility. It's something that we're establishing right now, uh, you know, with our students right uh, in, in the pre-doctoral clinic, that you can measure the, the tissue mobility. If it's moving, then you can, you know, extra orally uh, build up the space, the emergence profile, uh, after taking the lab analog, and then you can contour it. You can cure it and give it to the lab technician. And the lab technician knows the dynamic of the tissue environment uh, in a way that he can fabricate a crown nicely merging through the gum tissue. Whereas if you just, uh, you know, just take an impression and send it to the lab, they really don't have the, that dynamic information. And what if the keratinized tissue is too thick? You know, it's been years after placing implant and the tissue is not mobile, then, you know, most of the clinicians, we surgically create the, you know, the custom healing abutment or even a larger size of the healing abutment that we can nicely develop and sculpting the tissue so that we can create that emergence profile around the implant. And in this case, you know, in a educational 
institutional uh, setup, we are establishing a uh, more more uh, the systematic workflow to to allow the students to learn to contour the shape of the emergence profile through the wax up first, and then uh, followed by uh, polymerizing resin, uh, you know, to to get that uh, removable uh, type of the, the custom healing abutment that's inserted by the the healing cap, so that we can insert this uh, the, the intraorally. And we made a little internal incision to allow the tissue movement. And once it's healed, then we can take a final impression uh, for a more high quality uh, implant crown rehabilitation. What if we're involving multiple teeth? Uh, and it's not just the emergence profile. You, know, you need to think about how the pontic design you're developing. You know, this, this is one of my case that uh, in the prior practice, after placing implants, uh, you know, we most of the most of the uh, the clinicians they tend to develop the soft tissue after placing implants. But uh, if you think about the whole trajectory of the treatment, it's always better to think about it at the very beginning. So in this case, uh, I prepped the teeth and created the obipontic site, and that became the reference line. You know, by the time we already had the aesthetic information, the occlusion and the level of the occlusal plane and the vertical dimension, in a way that we are sure that we're gonna leave the, the pontic design at that level that I already achieved. And then we sort of preserve that tissue throughout the whole treat. So in, in this um, creative uh, workflow, we created this, we milled the obipontic area so that we can sort of put it back to the t support flush uh, temporary. Uh, in a way to make the uh, implant support provisional, splinter provisional is more more biologically biological references to 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 seal the area of the vipontic sites, so that on the ground zero of extraction of the teeth, we can preserve those soft tissues and then create a nice vipontic sites. Uh, in my opinion, more, most biological pontic design, and along with the emergence profile that I mentioned before. And uh, I think it's really important to, to incorporate all those soft, sophisticated details for your, your treatment modality, because that's, that's what it distinguishes the high quality care. Then you sort of place an implant and retrospectively go back to develop the soft tissues or et cetera. And if you think about the distal extension cases, uh, this, this is one of the case that uh, well represented the pre-existing implants. Um, you know, it's been there 30 years. So, um, but the angulation wise, uh, I was a little off. So if you are to take an impression, it would be quite challenging, especially if it's internal connection. In this case, uh, it was external connection where I was able to take an impression, but I'm trying to say is planning the implant position, especially in the posterior regions is critical. Uh, in this case, we came up with a semi retain uh, the implant crowns to sort of um, you know, get the best out of this, you know, the, the clinical situation itself, but it'd be more ideal to, to plan it ahead of time for a more predictable and systematic approach. But for that, <clears throat> whenever you place an implant, you need to always keep in mind the trajectory of restorative blueprints, whether it's from digital wax up or provisionalizations. So here's a good example of the previous uh, the case that if you, if you draw the line of occlusal plane, which is the red line right now, you can appreciate the well aligned axis line angle to the central access holes. But what if the occlusal plane was a little more superior, you know, because of the, the opposing uh, interdigitation, it was a little more superior. Then all of a sudden the access hole was becoming a little more misaligned. And, and this shows the importance of addressing the prosthetically driven surgery uh, especially in the posterior uh, region, if it's a this extension, it becomes more critical where we don't really have the occlusal references, whether it's internal partial or wax ups. If we are missing space, then it becomes even more critical. So as we mentioned, uh, we're establishing the Yomi Robotic, uh, the surgical curriculum for the pre-docs uh, in NYU. And uh, you know we have a case that's representing the case of uh, the the example that I mentioned before. Uh, in the disc extension cases, um, you know we don't really have the patient doesn't really have the internal processes 
uh, then when you are to take a CBCT, you don't really have the reference. You know, you don't really have the reference to, you know, start with where the occlusal tables are. Then, uh, you know, with that foundation, uh, you can be creative. You know, we, we took the bite registration on the patient's, uh, the left quadrant as patient bite down, and then we sort of preserved the opposing arch intercostipation information. And then we you know, flew the radio opaque flowable composite uh, in the, the central fossa area. And then, we, and then we took the CDCT, which allows us to visualize the trajectory of the centric fossa area on our CBCT. And then once you have that, you can do the digital wax up on your software, which becomes a, a lot more predictable for your future prosthetic trajectory of the rehabilitation. Whereas you just create this wax ups with no information, then you may potentiate the discrepancy later. <clears throat> So the placement of the implant fixture in reference to the ideal anatomical regions is indeed critical, but uh, it is becoming more accessible and, and efficient along with computer guidance system. And, and then um, therefore more emphasis is focused on the final goal destination, the shape and position of future processes. So I would like to show um, one of my case, uh, you know, pretty much step-by-step step, uh, you know, sequence of it so that you get to see what type of uh, you know, the, the, the analysis and assessment is incorporated in this case. Uh, it, it was presented with the, 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 um, the failed implant previously and the failing implants uh, as, of, as you can see on the, the screen uh, with the rampant carries on the mandibular arch, uh, which was uh, planned for the prosthetic driven full arch implant rehabilitation. So whenever you encounter with these cases, uh, you need to be able to map out your action plans in terms of giving the ideal treatment plan as well as alternative routes. In this case, the patient pursued more fixed rehabilitation. And you start with the analysis. Um, you know, uh, for this case, uh, you know, right a second I saw this case, I started the aesthetic analysis. And as you can see, the patient showed the ideal gun line where I can idealize the obey pontic sites that I showed you previously. And I prefer to use Obepontic sites because uh, if we can, uh, that's the most aesthetic and more, most biologically, you know, more hygienic uh, type of processes. So I prefer to type, you know, class three type of BDR class, um, the full arch implant rehab for these type of cases. And then you, you um, perform your diagnostic assessments. You know, you mount the cast and you, you create uh, the aesthetic analogs so that you can transfer the patient's clinical presentation to the laboratory setting. And, uh, you know, you take the face bow, you know, in this case, uh, we treat it as if it's a maxillary full arch, uh, you know, denture case for the interim removal processes. And then, you know, we utilize intra-arch, uh, you know, the, for, the, for capturing the intra-arch uh, distance with the established vertical with the rims. And we took the bite with the face bow transpiration and uh, all of which came up with the internal processes. And right there, it became functional. We got the vertical dimension and we got the estimated initial uh, the occlusion so the patient can function with it. And, and that becomes the blueprint of starting our diagnostic wax up. And at that moment, we tra slowly translating into creating our occlusal schemes. Uh, if you were to you know, do the maxillary floor arch implant, are we going to you know, have the mutually protected canine guidance or are we going to establish group functions? So such things should be analyzed at this moment. It's so way before the even surgical intervention uh, should be assessed and uh, analyzed in order to give you the more, more clear direction for your treatment. And obviously during that time, you perform caries control and you do the basic prep and temporization uh, I use the plumeth methacrylate uh, for the sectional bridges. Uh, once you, you know, control the oral hygiene and page, put the patient into non-destructive equilibrium in a way that you don't see any further deterioration of occlusion or hygienic issues, then you move on to the next stage of performing, I mean, planning the implant surgeries. So in this case, as you can see, we are utilizing the maxillary term removal processes and mandibular sectional bridges. And, and now we have functional occlusion 
And then for this case, I use the duplicate of denture and the cut the flange off to analyze further uh, whether uh, the nasolabial angles is, is ideal. You know, in reference to the tissue and the, the junction of the, uh, the processes uh, is ideal for the type three, the image that I showed you, uh, whether it's really applicable for this case. And then once confirmed, you can move on to the next phase where getting further data acquisition. You know, in this case, I did this facial scannings and the scanning of the, the intraoral, um, the, the SDL files, and in a way that you can merge them together. And of course, we have a blueprint, dentures. Uh, in this case, I used uh, radio opaque fiducial markers where you can merge everything together along with the DICOM file and the surface files, and then you can put everything together to the software where you can do the surgery, the implant placement of the positions inside the software. And um, these days we have phenomenal you know, technologies coming up and even lab technicians, they're very experienced. They do these restorative surgery inside the software. And I personally prefer to do that by myself because I, I feel very enjoyable doing it. And, and, and I can see the whole scope of, you know, the, the whole comprehensive view of the case. So I enjoy doing it myself, but if you have a good team member, then definitely, you know, we, you could definitely collaborate with them. And, and once we have these implant fixtures inside the software, then you can meal the surgical guide. Uh, you know, in this case, I, I, I meal the, the, the bone anchor pin guide first, followed by the osteotomy guide. And then you can plan your, your surgeries at that moment. So right now you already pre-planned the position of the implant, the software. And of course uh, you need to always prepare the backup plan. And even if it's a guided surgery, I was, you know, it's, it's preferable to have, you know, get you ready for freehand surgeries in case something goes wrong during the surgery. And uh, along with all those preparation, pre-planning, uh, and then, you know, the, the restorative, uh, implant surgery inside the software, you can come up with those strategic uh, the plan uh, and then the meal guides and also a very accessible, very predictable uh, clinical outcome of the processes later. So uh, in the surgical arena, we start with the bone anchor pin. And as you can see, I sort of shaped the pre-existing healing cap in a way that I can insert the, the initial surgical guide. And uh, we removed the pre-existing uh, failing implants and uh, you know any just like any clinical procedures if you're if you're placing implant you need to be able to how to explain them so you know in this case we remove those implants in a very less invasive way uh, so that we can place our our new implants utilizing our uh, new uh, the osteotomy guide and after the placement we pursued the uh, you know, the primary wound closure and the healing, uh, you know, after the, the one week healing until the healing of the patient being uh, wearing the interim processes, uh, we did the bone grafting on the, the, the labial contour of the, the crustal region. So we sort of flat, we removed the whole flange of the, the acrylic and uh, by putting the tissue conditioner with it. And, uh, you know, as you can see after the, the implant support provisional, you can develop those soft tissues that we narrated at, you know, before is more, more biologically favorable. And then, you know, the emergence profile as well as the opaque pontic sites. Um, should this here. So the final restorative material we use is the molecular zirconia, uh, the splinted, uh, the flourish processes. And as you can see, uh, you know, if you see the, if you remember the very beginning of our slide, we, we sort of began the treatment of this case with the view of, of the trajectory of our future final processes. So you see the contour of the emergence profile and the pontic site that we were able to develop uh, at the beginning because we were able to analyze it at the time. And uh, you know, it's really a fantastic approach in a way that you know, it's it, it, it's a it's a collaborative teamwork. You know, you have to engage the patient to you know to start the improvement of oral hygiene, and you as a you know restorative or reconstructive dentist should be able to plan out you know your your restorative plan at the beginning 
And if you're placing implants yourself, you need to incorporate that for your surgical uh, placement as well. So the final goal, as, as we shared, uh, is the aesthetic, you know, rehabilitation, occlusal, and functional reconstruction at the same time in a way that we can predictably place implant uh, later, uh, you know, during the, during the surgical placement. So the CBCT is like, it's like a Google map, you know, the while the, the guided implant surgery is like a GPS direction system while driving. And, and as if the Tesla's auto driving mode emerged in the market, but we now see the innovative technologies. And, and along with all these exciting surgical transformations, uh, what are the unchanged things? Uh, well, the final destination is always the same, regardless of how fast or efficient we drive on the road. And, and our ultimate goal of surgically placing implant fixture is the defender processes rehabilitation on top of it. So whether employing a non-flap approach, avoiding bone augmentation, or even reducing the surgical chair time, we always need the final implant supported and retained processes at the end. So handling these reconstructive cases, both surgically and prosthetically, uh, you get to experience viewing things that could potentially benefit the patient care. And, and in the field of biomechanics, the full arch implant rehab and cantilevers, uh, you know, we have been using only linear ratio uh, to, to give a little more, you know, to allow more in-depth uh, studying in the biomechanics. Uh, but, you know, I came up with the arch area ratio, oh, arch area ratio where we can utilize uh, you know, more constructive and categorized way to, 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 to uh, have more sophisticated uh, the group of the, uh, the, the cantilevers. Recording. And it's, it's, uh, it's not only prosthetically, but also as a surgical point of view, while we perform surgical interventions in the full arch empire we have, you can also view things that can be correlated with the improvement in the patient care. And in full arch uh, implant rehabilitation, visualizing the restorative trajectories from the very beginning of the diagnostic phase to, to each and every step of treatment execution is no doubt the primary core value. And if you're a restorative dentist, then it is absolutely critical that you communicate with the surgeon in every aspect of the treatment, app, the treatment sequence. And if you're a surgical specialist, then you should always keep in mind the, the ultimate prosthetic value in your surgical arena. And when you're a team player or whether you're a team player or a solo practitioner, the most important thing is that you, you incorporate all aspects of, of treatment values for your patient care. And, and as a surgical and reconstructive prosthetist, it is such a humble and grateful experience to, to sort of amalgamate all aspects of treatment rationales and modalities, especially utilizing the modern uh, computer guided systems However, it is also important that you set the boundary of your treatment scope to the range that you can manage the complications. For example, I, I do not uh, place zygomatic implants, which may involve more catastrophic or, or facial complications. Uh, so whether it's a surgical treatment or prosthetic reconstruction, you should strategically set your limitation of practice to, to maximize the, the efficiency of patient care. And as you can see, the robotic haptic surgical advancement that I showed you previously, the, uh, the technology will only get better every day, especially in surgical arenas. Then, uh, then it becomes even more critical to emphasize the unchangeable ultimate destination, the prosthetic rehabilitation, which should be served as a concrete blueprint of uh, surgical intervention in implant dentistry. So since the majority of the audience is, is pre-doctoral students, I'd like to close up my lecture uh, by saying that you should find the area that, that you feel passionate and truly enjoyable with. And dental school education is like tasting an appetizer in your five course dinner. Uh, you should find a soft specialty area that you can continuously study and fine tune your knowledge, uh, being open-minded with innovative and creative ideas, uh, which brings you a genuine happiness. And, and when, you, when you begin really enjoying your sub specialized profession, I believe, you could then walk on the path of becoming the pioneer in the field. So that was it for my lecture today. Um, it's clean 40 minutes. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Chu asked for 45 minutes, but I finished five minutes earlier because it's a holiday. Yeah.
So thank you very much for uh, watching this lecture. Yeah. Fantastic presentation, Dr. Kim. Um, and we'll, we'll have to dock you five minutes in the future next year. <laughs> uh, very amazing photography, great case documentation. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, a few weeks ago, our class had a uh, lecture on photography. So now you can really see um, how that comes into play in terms of documenting your cases, as well as if you ever go on to lecture like Dr. Kim is, uh, it really helps you out a lot to capture things right from the beginning and not to miss any steps in between. Um, just wanted to make a few comments and if you guys have any questions, you can think of them now and feel free to uh, chime in. Um, but uh, I love that um, how Dr. Kim reviewed that although there is technology going on and it's always gonna happen and it's improving patient outcomes and giving us more conservative treatments and better healing times in terms of flap the surgery, um, he really emphasized the need for uh, the basic principles. Uh, that doesn't change. Uh, you saw that he could have been, this patient could have been a complete denture. He's still using the face bow. We kind of get on yeah. the students about that sometimes, um, but there are the, the bottom line, there are no shortcuts, correct, Dr. Kim? We have to oh, yeah. really have yeah. your diagnostics set down solid. Uh, he talked about caries control, getting all that worked out before going to these big surgical procedures, um, knowing your fate, your, the principles of occlusion, um, diagnostics. And uh, this is very eye-opening case because uh, normally in a pre-doc level, if we saw something like what Dr. Kim treated with a dentulous maxilla and the patient wants implants, what do we do? We swipe a referral to grad pros. And then we never know what happens to the patient, but now we kind of got to see a glimpse into what is possible. Um, so I thank you so much for that, Dr. Kim. Uh, wonderful lecture. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes, And if please. you're <laughs> shy, you can chat it in. I'll ask it for you. But I think maybe everyone's just digesting it because it was a very, very interesting topic. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the presentation itself uh, was, it could be quite uh, challenge, like challenging to understand the, the whole scope of the treatment, but um, it sort of gives you an idea of you know, how you can incorporate things together, um, you know, as a, as a surgical prosthodist, you know, and, and, and I'm sure there are some prosthodists uh, who doesn't want to see a blood and, and they really focus on the pros aspect of it, which is, uh, you know, which requires uh, fantastic teamwork. You know, you need to find a good surgeon who's who's communicating with you to to achieve the the best clinical outcome of your your reconstruction cases. So that also is an important message that I want to tell you. If you don't want to pursue any surgical intervention, that you need to find a good team team uh, teammate, uh, whether periodontist or or, or a surgeon. Um, so yeah. Yes, so this, Dr. Kim is what we call a, a double threat because he's restoring and he's doing the surgery. Well, so as I said, you know, there are uh, things that I put myself a boundary. I don't do zygomatic implants, uh, although I value uh, some cases uh, previously failing implants, no alveolar crust, uh, then we have, and, and the patient prefers like fixed type of option, then we have no option for zygomatic implants that I would love to collaborate with oral surgeons. And if it's more intense uh, bone documentation procedures, like involving like a vertical augmentations, then I collaborate with the periodontist. So, you know, it's not like you're limiting your scope of collaboration. You know, you should always be open-minded that I think the key thing is find out your interests and, and you, you should be able to, you know, decide when to refer out, when to collaborate with, and then your, your specialized area that you you can confidently deliver to the patient. So, you know, I think that's the key message. And uh, yeah. I've got a question real quick. Yes. So when you, when, let's say you get into restorative and you, like we talked about, you are not really necessarily interested in the surgical part or you don't have the time to do the training or whatnot. It's not part of your, um, treatment options. So in terms of communicating with a surgeon, 
do you, mm-hmm. I guess, where do you draw the line on what information you send them? Do you just give them the location of the teeth? Do you give them the location of the teeth plus the preferred path of the implants? What kind of what, what do you mm-hmm. send them and how, what does that communication look like? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, it depends on your team and your pre-existing environment. So let's say if you have like a restorative surgeon who's a lab technician, who's in charge of implant you know, planning, then you have, you know, less communication, you know, the, the, bur- the cognitive burden, I would say. But if you don't, then you got to be as detailed as possible, you know, like not only the implant position, but also, you know, what type of full arch, uh, what type of final processes you're trying to achieve. So let's say you're doing full arch rehab and you know, you, you're thinking about like all pontic sites with no prosthetic tissue junctions, then you need to give the full information of the implant depth and also your transmucosal abutment, what type of uh, processes you're achieving, whether it's a screw retain or semi retain. So the more information you give to the surgeon is better, but, you know, realistic point of view, you're not every team member is like that. So, you know, at least you need to direct them if you're to restore it to the level that you are satisfied. So, you know, let's say you're working with or surgeon or periodontist, then you should guide them. Okay, I want the implant fixture in that level for allowing three millimeters of transmucosal abutment because of your aesthetic assessment before. So it, it could be quite subjective, but you know, you could be creative as well, but the more detailed information, the better. And, and these days uh, I see a lot of my colleagues are are communicating through like a zoom call or that there's been more advancement in terms of communicating. So let's say you have a case, then you can put up the computer and then everybody's on the same chat and the lab technician, uh, you know, and as a real time, they, they place an implant on the software and then anybody doesn't like the position, they can raise their hands and, and they can fix it right away. So you can do simultaneous planning together. And I see my colleagues are doing it. So and I'm sure the technology will get better. Like we have, you know, the, like a Google, the, the Oculus, you know, incorporation as well, where you can incorporate the, uh, the augmented reality. And, and that, that's where the next phase of the, the development is. And it's very exciting to see those types of um, advancements. So. Dr. Kim, I have a question from Dr. Schloss in the chat. Um, yeah. He said, in doing full mouth rehabilitation with existing implants that are failing, quote, 50% bone loss, is it better to treat the failing implants or remove the implants and place new implants? Good question. So that also depends on the patient, you know. I I get to see uh, different scope of the patient with different ages and their interests. So also the patient finance is also an important factor too. So you as a, you know, the provider should combine everything and then propose the most ideal approach. So let's say the patient, very elderly patient with pre-existing implants, 50% failure, but the patient want to preserve, doesn't want any surgeries and, uh, you know, want to keep their implant. Then what I would do is that unless it's not a failed implant, you know, meaning that has a structural integrity with it, then I can try to, you know, flap open and then polish the exposed uh, threads. And then you think about a little more creative, uh, you know, the routes like, you know, the bar retain over dentures or you know, some of the creative, you know, tr- tr- treatment routes that you can propose to the patient. Whereas the patient that I showed you on my slide was a more relatively younger patient who had a, you know, multiple failed implants with a non-hygienic environment. Then I educate the patient and then the patient can afford the full fixed new rehab. Then I choose to explant them and then bone graft it. And, uh, and then, you know, they're replaced with the new processes. So it, it's more like you're, you're customizing, you know, every you know, patient care uh, in, in, you know, specifically for, for their own status, you know. <clears throat> Any other questions from the audience before we let have, Dr. Kim enjoy his day off? I have, sorry, I have one more question. <laughs> You yes. talked about you know, talked about having um, two guides for implant placement. Uh-huh. One with the actual you know guided holes that will that will take you exactly where you want to go, and then one yeah. that I guess is just a basically a milled, um, ba- more or less full denture that gives you some flexibility. And you said things can go wrong with mm-hmm. with 
uh, milled guide. And I've heard that from dentists mm. as well. What are the problems other than it not fitting well? What are the issues that come up mm. that make you audible over to the other guide that's not um, that doesn't have the whole pre-drilled holes in it? Yeah. So if you get to see those cases and you do the surgeries and you, you get to see the more realistic aspects of like including laboratory fees, you know, how much it really costs you know, to meal those guides and all those plannings, et cetera. But um, preparing any, you know, possible complication is, is always a good thing because, you know, for instance, uh, we meal the guides and then you put the bone anchor pins and then the osteotomy of the bone anchor pin could be a little off. You know, let's say the patient you know, moves around and then when you're, and these days we have different techniques, you know, to resolve that issue. We, we meal the guide and then we fix the foundation guide when, and then you can detach the coronal portion of it. So you leave the foundation guide inside. But the case that I showed you is, is, a, is a relatively simpler and I had a pre-existing implant that I use as if tooth supported guide. So it had a more structural integrity and it didn't really move around. But let's say you didn't have implants and then you only purely, you know, relied on the tissue, then that could be, a, you know, some of the discrepancy potential. And let's say you drill the three holes. And then when you put a second guide, if that hole position wasn't exactly the same, then, then it's not going to go in, you know? So that was actually one of the most uh, common downsides in that uh, surgical uh, workflow. And now uh, we have more established, um, more predictable uh, surgical technique uh, that you can leave those foundation guide inside so that you don't need to worry about that, um, you know, the mis potential misfit. But it, it doesn't really limit it to that, the bone anchor pin guide. Uh, it could be other issues like, uh, you know, let's say you, you meal the guide that's supported by the bone, not the tissue. And then, you know, DICOM file has quite a bit of distortion. And when you are to, you know, place this guide to the bone and then the level of the bone wasn't exactly the same that you had on the software, then it could create some of the misfit due to that impingement with the bone. So such kind of things is a bit practical, but uh, it happens. And, um, you know, so, so therefore I want to say, you know, if you're placing implants and they're utilizing those guided surgery, you, you need to be able to, you know, you need to be prepared to, to handle those, uh, you know, the situation with a freehand surgery. So, so that's why whenever I teach my students, I, I really emphasize that you master the freehand implant surgeries first. And then you, you, you sort of excel the guided surgery after that, because you need to be able to handle those complicated situations without, you know, the computer guided systems, because things can happen. Even the robotic, you know, assisted, you know, the systems, things can happen. So, you know, it's always important to be able to, you know, have those principles in your mind uh, before incorporating new technologies. Very good point, Dr. Kim. Yeah. Okay, so it's getting close to the hour. Any other questions from anyone? Okay. Um, so uh, I want to thank Dr. Kim again. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, Dr. Kim is more hip than I am, so I think he uses that thing called Instagram. Uh, and I think you can follow him on that. So um, maybe you guys, if you want to uh, keep in touch with him, he's a great resource.